Hello, and welcome to Lecture 5. Lecture 5 is incorporating what we talked about in the last lecture about how cytokines and chemokines are produced after immune cells, toll-like receptors are activated by pieces of bacteria and virus. So I haven't told you before what pieces of bacteria and virus, that's what today is about. So it's called pathogens and the human immune response. All right. Okay, so hopefully at the end of this lecture, you will be able to identify the similarities and differences between bacterial and viral life cycles, understand what parts of bacteria and virus are recognized by the immune system, and then think about where you're gonna find the tolic receptors. I haven't showed you exactly where, I've talked about it, but there's a great figure coming up that will tell you exactly where you'll find the tolic receptors. And then the last two parts are additional killing mechanisms of innate immune cells. I did mention that macrophages can straight up make hydrogen peroxide inside of themselves. Uh, this is to do with that process. So oxidative damage that uh, macrophages can create. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about complement. I know a lot of students going off to medical school, students in graduate school often need to know the components of complement. I do have to give a shout out to Cursigats. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce um, the channel name, but they have a team of animators that just really nailed the visual elements of complement. It wouldn't help you study for an exam, but like putting together how it works, I mean, they just did it gorgeously. And of course, you know, they've got a great British narrator too. So good job. All right. Um, today, we're going to talk about what the heck gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria are, and I'll finally tell you a little bit more about these giant scary words. So peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan is the outside of gram-positive bacteria. Lipopolysaccharide, often abbreviated LPS, is the outside of gram-negative bacteria. All right, so let's look at the bacteria. Um, they have chromosomal information, just like we do, in the form of DNA, just like we do. But theirs is a big old jumbled mess in the middle of the cell. It could be somewhere else. It, there's no nucleus, basically. So if something uh, that preys upon bacteria, there are viruses that attack bacteria called bacteriophages. If they can like pierce through the coating, the cell wall, they can easily access the chromosome. So our DNA is hidden behind two firewalls and theirs only has one. Okay, so here's the chromosome all clumped together. Um, bacteria have something we do not have. Some of them have a capsule or slime layer. If you've ever skipped brushing your teeth and you run your tongue across it, yeah, you're feeling a capsule or slime layer of bacteria. If you've slipped on a slippery rock crossing a lake, it's potentially um, slime or capsule from bacteria as well. All right, so they have the capsule, they have a cell wall, and then they have the plasma membrane. Um, other things they have are plasmids. Um, I worked on this for a while you can actually take plasmids from one bacteria and give them to another bacteria with either heat, electricity, or chemicals. Now, bacteria are actually pretty loose with their plasmids. Unfortunately, the vast majority of bacterial resistance comes from bacteria swapping plasmids. Yep. Okay, so bacteria come in different shapes, and the shapes usually tell you something about their name. So streptococcus or staphylococcus bacteria are circle-shaped, spherical. Um, rod-shaped bacteria, if you've heard of Bacillus anthracis, that's a rod shape. Um, they can also come in spiral form, filament form, and spirochete form. The vast majority are either coccus or rod-shaped. And it's relatively easy to see these under a microscope. All right, so how do bacteria grow? This is actually really important. 
we've been talking about the timing of the immune response and why it's critical to have a fast innate immune response followed up by a slower, long-term adaptive immune response. All right, so there's a lag phase of bacterial growth. Then when they adjust to their new environment, they go exponential. This is called the log phase. This is particularly dangerous because during the lag phase, ideally, let's say you've been infected by a bacteria. The lag phase is this period of time where your innate immune cells can find and destroy the bacteria before they start growing out of control in this log exponential phase. Um, then depending on where they're at, they hit a stationary phase in most laboratory settings. Um, so this is all dependent. Like, are you talking about a laboratory setting? Are you talking about an infection? Um, but either way, lag phase is where they're getting used to the environment, acquiring nutrients. Log is the exponential growth phase. If they run out of nutrients, they hit stationary phase. You can actually keep bacteria in log phase in a lab if you continually give them new nutrients and remove waste products. And yes, bacteria have waste products just like we do. And then if you um, don't feed them, there is a death phase. All right, so the Graham stain was invented over 100 years ago by a Danish scientist named it after himself, Hans Christian Graham. Now, this, is, this was critical before bacteria, um, before antibiotics were made into different groups. Um, most antibiotics now are broad spectrum, meaning doctors don't have to send you back for a gram stain to tell if it's positive or negative because most antibiotics will work for both. However, there still are antibiotics that require a gram stain because they only work for gram positive or gram negative. So. Um, Hans Christian Graham figured out how to tell the difference, <laughs> but your innate immune cells already knew they didn't need this test. All right, so they differentiate bacteria by the chemicals and physical properties of the cell wall. I'm going to show you a picture of each. All right, most bacterial cell walls are negatively charged, so Graham used a positively charged cationic. I always remember cationic as positive because most people like cats, especially internet people like cats. So cationic is a positively charged dye. Um, crystal violet and saffronin. Crystal violet is purple. Saffronin is pink. All right, so here's what you do. I've done this just hundreds of times. <laughs> All right, so you would take a sample of, let's, let's pretend that this person, you thought that they were septic. They had bacteria in their blood. So you take a blood sample, you'd put a drop on a slide, You'd smear it flat, and then you would let it dry. Or you'd fix it with alcohol, whichever. And then you would apply crystal violet to it. Any bacteria would be stained purple to start. Then you would apply iodine to fix the crystal violet. Then you would wash away any of the excess purple. Now here, some of them stay purple, and some of them are washed clear. The purple ones are gram positive. The ones that are clear here are gram negative. Now, when they're clear, you can't see them. So if, if at this step you took the slide to a microscope, you just see purple dots. You just think that they had a, a caucus infection um, that was gram positive. But that's not the case. So you need to also apply, it's called a counter stain. You have your first stain and then you have your counter stain. And anything gram negative appears pink in saffronin. All right, so why? Why does this happen? I might flip back and forth just a teensy bit. Positive, gram positive is purple. The reason these turn purple is they have this really big, thick layer of peptidoglycan. Now, why are the negative pink? Oopsie doodle, here we go. Their peptidoglycan is hidden in like a little sandwich. So the LPS lipopolysaccharide binds lightly to um, the crystal violet. It doesn't have a strong reaction. So when you use the alcohol to wash it away, it just rinses off. But here, this thick layer of peptidoglycan holds the purple. So that's why the positive ones with that big thick layer of peptidoglycan remain purple. And then the ones that have LPS on the outside 
um, reject it, just washes away, and then they pick up the saffronin. Okay. All right. So the most important point <laughs> of determining gram positive versus gram negative is what is interfacing with the outside world. So peptidoglycan. This is going to bind to a different toll-like receptor than a gram negative. That's partly why it matters. Your immune cells have evolved to find these two types of bacteria, these two families of bacteria, to be different enough to react differently to them. All right. So yes, there's these little purple squigglies and there's the plasma membrane. But the most important point is that this thick peptidoglycan layer is actually going to activate toll-like receptor 2 and its partners. Gram negative, those immune cells are gonna find these first, <laughs> um, these green and blue hexagons. It's gonna interact with these first. That's LPS. This is actually gonna bind to toll-like receptor four. And all this will come up again. And then they've got their hidden peptidoglycan here and then the plasma membrane. It's also thought that the gram negative bacteria has evolved more recently because it has a more complex um, layering. All right, so what does that virus have? Let's see here. All right, most of you are familiar with this after having lived through a pandemic, but let's go over the general pieces anyway. The internal component of a virus is either DNA or RNA. There are pros and cons to each. DNA can potentially interact with RDNA. That can be dangerous. RNA, like the flu virus and like uh, COVID-19, they're more likely to genetically mutate. So there's pros and cons to each. The DNA is more stable. Um, but again, it can then hide in your own chromosomal DNA, like herpes virus, like cold sores. All right, so let's move from the inside out. Now we're heading to the protein coat. This protects the nucleic acid. This is why some viruses have the ability to live for a period of time on surfaces. Other viruses can hardly live outside of a human for whatever minutes. And then you've got your envelope. The envelope contains the spike proteins. The spike proteins are how viruses access our cells. Each of these spikes is specific for a different type of cell. They could be specific for T cells, macrophages, lung cells, and it just depends on what the spike binds to. All right, so let's take a look at the two different life cycles. All right, the RNA viral life cycle can start here outside of an immune cell. This doesn't even have to be an immune cell. It could just be a regular endothelial cell. So here it is. There is either RNA. Well, we just told you it's RNA. <laughs> There's RNA right here. It's got the um, protein protecting it, and then it's got the envelope. So it's going to get picked up by this cell. They made a terrible mistake by picking it up. It happens. Sometimes the spike proteins pretend like it's something else, and that encourages the cell to pick it up, called endocytosis. So here it is, it's in a vesicle. And once it, once the RNA virus recognizes it's in a vesicle, it uncoats. Yeah, they can tell when they're inside of a cell. They uncoat, allowing the RNA to come out. The RNA, um, if you're not familiar with the way that DNA is turned into RNA, is turned into protein, um, DNA creation only happens in the nucleus. RNA creation only happens in the cytosol. Okay, so um, the RNA gets copies of it made in the cytosol. And then proteins are also made. The capsid protein is made so it can get repackaged. Um, and then it will bud. So... Budding is a slow process whereby a new virus is released, but now it's also kind of cloaked in your cell membrane. So it can be harder to detect by your immune system at this step. It's got some layer of disguise on 
more or less a cellular disguise. Okay, budding is a slow process whereby the cell will make thousands of copies of this terrible virus and um, it's not going to destroy the cell immediately. The other option is that thousands of copies of virus erupt at once, destroying the cell and spreading them farther. The DNA viral life cycle is quite different because of what I told you 10 seconds ago. Um, herpes simplex virus, if you ever had a cold sore, um, some of you might have resolved it, some of you might have cold sores for life. And this is why, because DNA viruses are evil in a different way. Herpes simplex virus has gained access to this yellow cell. It's not gonna make copies in the cytosol. It doesn't have the machinery. It needs to get all the way past your second firewall, like I called it earlier, the, um, the nucleus. It needs to get past your nuclear envelope. So the DNA comes here, enters the nucleus. That's where the DNA machinery lives. So now that it's here, it's got the right machinery. It's going to borrow our um, DNA replication enzymes and it's going to create additional copies of itself. They're going to have to leave the nucleus and also bud out from this cell containing our, our cell membrane and also some level of protection at this point. Another terrible thing about DNA viruses is that often they hijack our DNA machinery to the degree that they might copy our DNA too and so that can result um, in warts. So herpes simplex virus, oopsie doodles, no, it's um, human papillomavirus. That's the one that causes warts. And the reason you get extra cell growth is because as the DNA is stealing your machinery and making copies of itself, it makes copies of your cells too, which is how human papillomavirus can turn into cervical cancer causing the cells of a cervix to grow out of control. All right, so now that we've talked about some of the villains, we're back to talking about some of the heroes. So how do our immune cells detect viruses and bacteria? You know the answer. It's toll-like receptors, primarily toll-like receptors. You saw this slide two lectures ago. And a lot of these words were probably large and terrifying and didn't make sense. So we are revisiting them. I told you earlier, Tolic Receptor 2, pardon my pointer, here we are, Tolic Receptor 2 and its partners, its partners are 6 and 1. 2 and 6. <laughs> so these are its partners. Um, they find peptidoglycan. And now you know that peptidoglycan is the largest layer of a gram-positive bacteria. To like receptor four is binding to lipopolysaccharide, the outside of a gram negative bacteria. All right. Um, to like receptor five is binding to flagellin. Ooh, I didn't make a note of that earlier. Sorry, going back, going back. This, this right here, this tail, this whipping tail around here, that's flagellin. Not every bacteria has flagellin, but a lot of them do use flagellin for motility, for moving. All right. So five. Five is flagellin. <laughs> F and F. <laughs> and tolic receptor nine is unmethylated CPG DNA, primarily from bacteria. Tolic receptor three is primarily how we find RNA viruses. Now you're going to see where they're at. Aha, this figure is very helpful. I actually added a few terms myself. So just as you would expect, the external components of viruses and bacteria bind to the outside of an immune cell. The internal components bind inside. Okay, so here's stage one. Stage one is tolic receptors two and six binding to gram-positive wall, um, the peptidoglycan on the wall. Two and one can also form. That's why I said two, one, six. Uh, flagellin binds to five, and then gram negative binds to toic receptor four. Okay, 
Now, what happens if a virus or a bacteria evades this external layer? Let's pretend it's a macrophage. And so here, um, the let's pretend it's a virus. The virus gets in and it's an RNA virus. It has uncoded and it's starting to wreak havoc. Well, guess what? It didn't evade the immune system. It's going to find toll-like receptor seven and then the process of inflammation will begin. Um, there will be a cascade of enzymes freeing NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B will enter the nucleus, creating probably primarily interfering gamma here. So let's say it was a, um, oh, this is two different types. So it can either bind to like receptor three or seven because there's many different flavors of RNA viruses, either SS for single strand or DS for double strand. So then let's pretend it's a um, a DNA virus or bacteria. There are bacteria such as tuberculosis that can penetrate the outer wall defenses and enter the cell. So either of these um, with their DNA being methylated in a different way than ours will activate to like receptor nine. And that will also kickstart cytokines and inflammation. <laughs> so why do you think the toll-like receptors evolved to bind to bacterial cell walls, flagellin, and nucleic acids? Okay, so here's the theory. The theory is that these are mission-critical pieces that are conserved. And what I mean by conserved is that although there are dozens of gram positive, probably hundreds, <laughs> but, um, hundreds of different types of gram positive and gram negative bacteria, yet they all have peptidoglycan. It's something they all have in common. Um, so there we go. And then flagellin, because that is how they move around. Moving around is critical. And nucleic acids, because that is the one thing that the virus and the bacteria can't hide. They can't hide their nucleic acid. So finding a pattern that is shared there will be helpful to the immune system forever. All right. So now that we've connected toll-like receptors, cytokines, and pathogens together, let's talk about two other defense systems. The other two defense systems are creating reactive oxygen species because nucleic acids like RNA and DNA can't handle exposure long-term to reactive oxygen species. They get broken to pieces, which is good for us. Um, the other thing is complement. All right, so here we go. Pathogens can enter immune cells undetected. It's, it's unfortunate, but it happens. So cells need a way to fight back internally. Macrophages and neutrophils can create ROSs, not rodents of unusual size, it's reactive oxygen species inside of their cytoplasm. Um, the two top ones are superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Um, reactive oxygen species damage RNA and DNA. They damage RNA faster than DNA, just in case you wanted to know, but they can also damage lipids and proteins. All right, so here we go. You start off with NADPH oxidase. This converts oxygen molecules to superoxide. It just means oxygen, in case you don't know, is quite reactive, uh, but superoxide is even more reactive. So then a second enzyme comes by, superoxide dismutase. And the only reason superoxide dismutase is important is because it takes superoxide and turns it into hydrogen peroxide, which is even more reactive. <laughs> So then lastly, there's a third enzyme, peroxidase and iron turns um, hydrogen peroxide into hypochlorite and hydroxyl radicals. So all three of these reactive oxygen species can break down RNA and DNA. Um, I do a handy little chart for my students um, where I've got the enzyme, what it's making and the chemical name to help them memorize for an exam. All right, so now there's complement. 
complement is actually made in the liver, but it interacts with the immune system. Some people have proposed, some, some researchers have proposed that complement was created before we had B cells, because you're going to see a few proteins that look like primitive antibodies. All right, here we go. So the liver actually makes it. Um, they were discovered after antibodies, but people still think they might have come first. Uh, they complement the antibody functions of the immune system. That's why they're called complement. Even though they're made by the liver, they interact with our immune cells. But they can also work directly. I have another chart for that. So the reason we're talking about this before we talk about B and T cells is because this is part of the innate immune system because it's not specific for one pathogen. It works on many, many pathogens. That's how you know it's innate. If it was specific, it would belong to the adaptive immune system. Alrighty, so complement is circulating right now in all of our blood and all of our tissue. There are over 30 complement proteins. I do not make my poor students memorize all 30, but there's a few. Um, what we do are the three main functions of complement. Increasing cell eating, increasing phagocytosis of immune cells. So ramping up macrophages. Also dendritic cells, but primarily macrophages. Those are C1 complex or mannose binding lectin. These names aren't gonna mean anything till you see them in action. They can also attract immune cells to sites of inflammation. What does that sound like from the last lecture? Hopefully it sounds like vasodilation. Sounds like chemokines. Yeah, these are like primitive chemokines. C3A, four, and five. So that one's really easy to remember. It's as easy as three, four, five. <laughs> um, and then the last one is so cool. And this is visualized really well in the Kursagats video about complement. Honestly, it's probably the first video when you type in complement. It ruptures bacterial cell walls by forming the MAC complex, which is like popping holes in a water balloon. I've got a decent figure, just not as cool as the animation, but I don't have a team or a British narrator. Okay, here we go. There's no way to put my head to be out of the way. That's okay. So there's three different ways to start complement. And then there's three different things that can happen afterwards which leads to a decent amount of confusion. The classical pathway starts off with an antigen-antibody complex. The mannose binding lectin starts with a lectin binding to a pathogen surface. This is kind of related to sugar carbohydrates on the outside of a bacteria. And then there's the alternate pathway, which can actually happen kind of randomly by interacting with the outside of bacteria. Okay. So then complement gets activated and it's gonna do those three things I already told you. So actually this slide is the simplest way to summarize this picture. They can, number one, recruit inflammatory cells. Number two, eat pathogens. Uh, number three, directly kill pathogens with the MAC complex. All right. A few more slides. So here is the vasodilation. Remember I told you that C3A, 4A, and 5A all attract additional immune cells, which is a lot like vasodilation and chemokines from the previous lecture. This is just an image of that happening. They're drawing like a circle, which could be um, a blood vessel, and how they're calling immune cells to this tissue right here. And they drew a macrophage. They drew different antibodies and a neutrophil. Okay, so now they're adding some additional information. Um, I have this summarized as a chart at the end in a little bit more efficient way. All right, so let's talk first about yellow, the classical pathway. The classical pathway has these primitive antibodies. And they're often called C1, classical step one, C1, Q, R, and S. So it is alphabetical. So you can see here that they actually look like primitive antibodies. I don't know, a fancy chandelier, somewhere in between there. All right, so here's how it starts. 
if C1 starts the um, complex, they can actually interact with antibodies. So that's why they complement the immune system. And if C1 complex binds to an antibody that's attached to a bacteria, it's going to start breaking apart all these other C-labeled proteins. <laughs> all right, so one will break apart two and four. Two and four can combine to make three. How much I wish they had <laughs> fixed their number system, <laughs> I can't even tell you, but it's true. It goes one, two, four, three. Three is actually the most important out of all the different pathways. Um, so this is classical. C3 can get broken into a different format in the alternative pathway. It can get broken down into B and A. So here, C3A, then C3B is cleaving five into A and B. But if you recall, anything with an A, C3A, C4A, and C5A are all acting like chemokines. But B is going to go and do something else. Very, very different. B sticks itself into a bacteria, B for bacteria. <laughs> so C5B sticks itself into a bacteria and then assembles six, seven, eight, nine into a whole, a pore. Check it out. Here, I'm gonna go back. I wanna show you right away. This is what it looks like here. Here, here they are in real life. <laughs> So this is a bacteria. This is probably a scanning electron microscope to get so close. Uh, this is the membrane attack complex. It's assembled and this bacteria is, is dying. So these rings form all over the bacteria and it is actually like punching a hole in a water balloon in that all the guts leak out and they are killed very, very rapidly. So let's back up to here. The first thing you need is C5B binding to six and seven. You can remember five, six, seven, you got this. So they all bind together in the bacteria for B and then along comes eight and then nine is actually the ring. So nine is the last one, but it's the ring. So B, you got five, six, seven, eight's another anchor, eight's an anchor, and then nine forms the ring. So. Typically about 16 molecules are required to form this pore and that destroys the bacteria. The other thing I wanted to show you is the middle pathway here in pink, it is color coded. The mannose binding lectin pathway binds primarily to sugar patterns. So um, you got glucose, but glucose has some cousins. We have mannose and fucose. <laughs> it's a lot like glucose. Um, so the mannose binding lectin actually finds these sugar carbohydrate patterns on the outside of bacteria and they kickstart the mannose binding lectin pathway. Not as cool as forming giant holes, but that's okay. All right, we're getting there. Here's your question and then we'll do a wrap up. All right, so complement is complicated. It's a complicated series of protein interactions that result in pathogen removal. All of the following statements are correct about complement, except All right, so is A true? Complement can attract innate immune cells to sites of inflammation. Yes. Complement is produced by the liver and affects multiple pathogens. Yes. To make it false, I could have said and affects only one pathogen or only one type of pathogen. Complement can rupture bacterial cell walls. True. Complement can be activated through classical, alternative, and C3 pathway. Nope. There is no C3 pathway, even though I told you C3 is the most important component because um, they all converge on C3, all of them. Um, it's the mannose binding lectin pathway. So that one's not true. All right, complement can increase phagocytosis of immune cells. Yes, they can through the classical pathway with C1, Q, R, and S. 
All right, so conclusions. Bacterial cell walls um, and fungal cell walls are recognized by the immune system. We briefly touched on fungi. I didn't point it out too much, but toll-like receptors one, two, and six, you know, they can have different binding partners. They bind to zymazan. I didn't go into it, uh, but zymazan is actually on yeast. Um, so if you've ever had a yeast infection, you wonder how your immune system figured that out. It's all like receptors. It's still toll like receptors, but it's one, two, and six, as if you were binding to a gram-positive bacteria. All right. So we've got viral RNA and viral DNA are also recognized by the immune system. That's toll like receptors three, seven, and nine. If it helps. <laughs> um, they're all odd numbers, which I kind of liked. That always helped me remember them. And they are not the first line of defense, but the second line of defense, because that's where you find viral RNA and DNA. You're not going to find it floating around outside. They're protected by the envelope. Toll-like receptors give cells two levels of defense, one on the outer membrane and one on endosomes. Endosomes are floating circles, vesicles, inside of the cell, in the cytosol. All right, lastly, creation of reactive oxygen reactive oxygen species, ROSs, allows cells to fight intracellular pathogens by damaging their DNA and RNA with superoxide, sounds like oxygen, but more super, <laughs> uh, hydrogen peroxide, and then those hypochlorite ions. All right, so here's my summary of that incredibly complicated stuff. So how do you recruit immune cells? C3A, C5A, C4A. How do you eat a pathogen better? <laughs> C1, mannose binding lectin, which also look like antibodies in case that didn't like flash by your head in the 10 seconds I went over it. Um, and C3B and 5A also help. And then how do you make those pores, the MAC, the membrane attack complex? How do you punch holes in the water balloon? You start off with B for bacteria, C3B, and then you have five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All right. Well, I hope you found that helpful, and I will see you next time.